Hi, everybody. Welcome to Social Perception, Chapter 3 of UNISA PYC 3701, something we're all naturally obsessed with through Netflix, TV, movies, and most coffee shops. Very easy and intuitive to understand. We just need to get some key concepts. Okay, you're seeing my website. Down here, I have exam questions and answers, and it's run like a little course, so it's fun to do, and it will give you an idea of what you need to know and what you need to remember. Okay, let's run through the information. Social perception, we're looking at nonverbal communication, attribution theories and biases, impression formation and impression making. Nonverbal communication, facial expressions, eye contact, bodily movements, posture and touch. Okay, nonverbal communication is very unconscious, tends to be irrepressible. Even people who are trying their best to control their behavior give tells. And we also respond to it often unconsciously, but with very strong impressions. Women are possibly better at interpreting it. This could be because of an evolutionary sexual dimorphism. There's interesting studies amongst transgender people that suggest that. And also possibly, or alternatively, power differentials. Okay, this is wonderful, it's three minutes, but I'm not gonna sit here for three minutes while it plays. Okay, facial expressions convey five universal emotions, anger, fear, happiness, disgust, and sadness. These are largely involuntary. Eye contact. Okay, look, there is some culturally variant uh, stuff about making eye contact. Uh, but some of it is universal. Staring is associated with aggression by an aroused observer. So if someone's very agitated, try not to make prolonged eye contact. A high blink rate may be associated with deception or discomfort. Body movement and posture. Okay, may express emblems. So like, thank you, goodbye. Those are emblems. Uh, body movement and posture represents a high or low state of arousal and maybe open or closed. And of course, there's much more than that. Touch. There's a strong positive or negative response to touch. It is linked to social hierarchy, who touches who and how, and shakes are associated with personality. So a firm and prolonged handshake is associated with being outgoing and confident and explorative. Okay. Deception. Most people don't notice deception, just slightly higher than chance, even amongst judges, social workers, um, and teachers, you would expect to be very good at, respect, at recognizing deception because they work with it every day. But we can learn to identify particular behavior indicating deception. There's a fantastic uh, channel on YouTube, the Behavior Panel, which is fascinating. It's a socially contagious behavior. If, if there's a lot of people who are lying, everyone around them starts lying too. It generates a lot of mistrust and lie and is like it's extremely socially toxic. Deception indicators, micro expressions, very fast changing and disappearing facial expressions, blink rate and other eye contact behaviors, inter-channel discrepancies when my face, when one nonviolent communication mechanism is saying one thing and another is saying another. That's an interchannel discrepancy. Exaggerated facial expressions, voice rising, and other indicators. Linguistic style. Um, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Okay, there's much more than that. That's just for now. Okay, sorry, I can't get this, the timing right on these things, but this is what I'm seeing. If I have no blood on my hand. If I have no blood on my hand. Attribution theories. Identifying the causes of behavior, traits, and disposition. We make internal or external attributions. In other words, internal is because of the person's uh, personality or internal feelings or motivations, whatever, or external, it's the situation. Correspondent inference theories. How we use information about people's behavior to infer their traits and disposition. Okay, 
correspondent inference theory. People look for the most informative of behavior, so they look to see if it's freely chosen. Empirical evidence says that this hypothesis isn't really true. We still count it against people even if when they don't even when they don't freely choose the behavior in their, for example, in a work situation. And non-common effects, in other words, um, it's specific to a specific situation, not to everything. And low in social desirability. So we know that it's not motivated by trying to win friends and influence people. Causal attribution theory. This is from Kelly. Is the cause situational or dispositional? He later added two more dimensions, stability, is the cause stable or unstable? And controllability, is it something the person has control over or not? Um, when trying to look at the cause of someone's behavior, is it situational or dispositional? You look for consensus with other people. Do other people behave in the same way? You look for continuity in time. Does the person do the same thing repeatedly over time? Um, and you look for distinctiveness compared to other responses to stimuli, okay? and situations. Attribution errors. Correspondence bias, or fundamental attribution error. This is when we um, look at other people and we habitually underestimate the impact of the situation and overestimate the impact of internal factors, such as disposition. The actor observer effect. For ourselves, we are hyper aware of the situation, but not for others. For others, we have a way of the disposition, but not for ourselves. Self-serving biases. When we get things right, we think it's our wonderful personalities, it's internal, and when we get things wrong, we think it's the situation. Now, this self-serving bias is much weaker in collectivist cultures than it is in individualistic cultures. Coping the attribution styles for self-assessment. Uh, maybe internal or external, maybe stable or changing, maybe global or context-specific. So when we're looking at ourselves, do we think the causes for our behavior are internal, external, stable over time, changing, global, context specific? When people are depressed, they believe that the causes for their life situations are internal, I'm not good enough, stable over time, I'll never be good enough, and global, everything I do is wrong. Impression formation. When we are forming impressions of people, it's very quick. It can be less than a tenth of a it can be as quick as a tenth of a second to a few seconds. It's gestalt. In other words, it's looking at the whole person. Central traits are key determinants for clusters of traits that we put together, such as warmth or coldness. That's a central trait. Everything changes when you spot that trait in someone. We use implicit personality theories, like, oh, firstborn means uh, dominant and ambitious. Cognitive averaging of information, that's how we put it all together. Um, at first we use exemplars, which are like concrete examples of behavior that tell us what this person's about. Then we look at people's behavior in terms of abstract, abstract traits, okay? We also use broad social categories to understand people. Create that presence. My favorite subject would be art. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to Hi, nice to meet you. Okay, impression management. There's two components to impression management. Um, oh, let's go to page. No, we haven't. This is the last part. This is about us. Uh, promoting ourselves to other people. So we either do this through self-enhancement, combing our hair, putting on makeup, um, or through other enhancement. Oh, you're wearing such a beautiful dress. Okay, and that is the end of the unit. Good luck. <laughs>